I am Techstar McCusker. Uh, we are going to be going over section one alpha today for block two. I call home Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I don't know where you all go home. I mean, additionally, I've been in the military for 13 years now, just about. So I call home really wherever they PCS me to, and I pack up and move my stuff. Uh, some of my hobbies are gaming, uh, playing magic, uh, general nerd stuff. I like anime, things like that. But I do also like going out and doing hiking and other things as well. Just not into sports. Don't talk to me about sports. I have no idea. For previous electronics experience, I have, like I said, about 13 years of experience. I have worked on anything from SATCOM to audio equipment for the president to quality assurance. So I, I have a very vast background on what I've done. And if you all have questions on anything that you might be doing, I know some of you should be getting your bases coming up here in these next uh, couple weeks. Or maybe you even have your bases already, which would be great because we can talk about that then. Um see what else do I want to talk about here. I am married, obviously. If you guys can't hear my wife in the background here, that's my wife talking. I've uh, been to three different assignments. So I started off at Fort Meade, Maryland, where I did satellite communications with a joint unit. Uh, I got to deploy to Iraq there. That was pretty cool. I enjoyed it a lot. After that, I went to Bowling Air Force Base, where I applied to work for White House Communications Agency. It's a really good job. I really liked it. It was four years of traveling around with the president and the vice president. It was pretty cool. I got to set up lights, audio, podiums, things like that. Uh, do all the audio recordings for the presidential library. It was it was a neat job. I really enjoyed it. Um, and you all can apply for that later in your careers, too, if you're active duty. I don't know who's active duty and who's guarding here, but I'm sure you all let me know. Uh, some other things. Let's see. So for the other thing. Uh, typically when I'm in class in person, I like to do something that's a little different. I'll ask just like one interesting fact about you or one thing that like nobody would really be able to guess about you. For me, uh, I played tuba for six years. So that's my other, um, I, I enjoyed it. I was in a marching band for four of those six years. It was not terrible. All right. So we'll go ahead and start with whoever's first on my list here. A1C Chung. Can't tell if you're typing or muted. Did I say his name right? Is it Chung? I see a couple of you are unmuted already. Oh, oh, oh gosh. That's, uh, that's some, some sweet, sweet electronic interference right there. Oh, he just lost connection. Okay. Well, if your mic works, uh, we'll go ahead and start with Londano then, since it looks like his microphone's working. If not, y'all can just type in here for your intros. That's cool. I'll just read it. So, Londano, you go ahead. Do uh, you just want it an interesting fact? Sure. I mean, you could you could talk about yourself for a second, or just an interesting fact, whatever. Uh, I guess uh, before the Air Force, I worked with my dad in construction. Uh, he traveled a lot, so I traveled with him. The last place we were at, it was Montana. I stayed there for like a two years or so. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, previous electronic uh, experience, I I almost got an associate's for um, uh, network engineering, but then I, I joined almost almost well, you, know, still, well, you know what they say about no, almost just, right i still got the a1c but i didn't get the degree that's right there you go okay that's not bad i like it that's good uh aaron bridges what about you um my name is aaron bridges first name christopher uh I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, which is better than Pennsylvania. Oh, whatever. Hey, um, I'm pretty nerdy. I like anime, I like playing video games, like Fallout, different stuff like that. Uh, okay. I was a state champ 
for um, Greco-Roman wrestling when I was in high school. Okay. And uh, I tried to get a psychology degree, but school's expensive. Nice. I currently have a bachelor's in psychology, so that's cool. All right. Uh, Airman Hubbard. Uh, I'm from upstate New York, four hours outside the city. Okay, my mom's from Queens. Yeah. Um, I failed geography, man, so I don't know what that means. means I lived about four hours from there. All right, cool, perfect. Yeah. So you're like country New York. Yes. Okay. Yes, like a mile from my house, it was just all farmland. So. Yeah, I didn't even know that part of New York actually existed until I went to visit one of my friends up in Boston a few years back. Most people don't. That's why I specify I'm not from the city. Oh, yeah, that's good. All right, cool. What's your interesting fact? Interest, uh, I ride a motorcycle. What kind of motorcycle you got? Yamaha FC07. A Yamaha. Ooh, that's nice. Hopefully it's not one I, of those ones that got recalled recently. I Not that I'm aware of. I should look into that, though. Yep, I would. All right, Aaron Hancock, you're next. I said that right, right? Hancock, uh, like the movie? Uh, I'm Aaron Hancock. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. And... That's like where country singers are, like right? Something about high school. I didn't hear the rest of that. I joined the Air Force because I've wanted to since high school. And... And RF transmissions was the career field you just always wanted? No, it's not. This is actually <laughs> Keep in mind this is being recorded, but okay. <laughs> That's honest. All right. Well, out of the reclass ones, this is the one I picked. So. Hey, that happens. So, what you do with your rest of your career that matters, right? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Airman Mullen? Is that how I said? Melon? Mullen? Melon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. Wow. All right. Let's uh, let's just have you go ahead and type that because I don't speak in digital format. Sorry, Gaston. I don't know if you speak robot. I've been told that I do have a robotic voice. Oh man, Aaron Mellon, I'm gonna have to mute you because uh, you are not coming across great. There you go. Yeah, you can go ahead and just just type if you like. Um, I don't know, my um, yes. Okay. Uh, while he's typing, the person who's next, you guys can go ahead and go. So, Aaron Matei, Matai, if you want to go ahead, if you want to unmute your mic, you can go ahead and start. Um, I, the rest of you who are muted, uh, I'm assuming you don't have microphones. So if you guys want to just type out your little intro thing, that's fine. Hey, Star McCormick. Hey. We're, so, we're, we're doing this like an actual class. I dig it. Yeah. So they're doing their I intros saw, right now. Yeah, no, I saw a whole bunch of people in here and I was like, yo, let's see what this is what? about. Yeah, it was, uh, block two, day one. Heck yeah. All right, so Aaron Richard says his name is Max Richard. He's from St. Petersburg, Florida. He likes video games. He hates Florida. Okay. He loves sports, mainly college football, but he's the best at ultimate frisbee. I didn't know that was a sport. All right. Uh, history and a bunch of other things. RF was not his first choice. I was changed from programming in basic. Youch. Well, like I said before with... Uh, Airman Hancock there, it's it's what you do with, with the rest of your time, you know, that matters. If you guys don't like this career field, you can always cross-train later, but you got to get through this for now. So I'd say be the best at what you're stuck with. Exactly, Airman it Matthias. is what it is. Airman Matthias with some pretty good information as well. Got oh. Richard shot in right after. Yeah? Individual. You want to go ahead and read his? Sure. So Airman, is it Matthias? Tay, can you give me a little bit of a chat on that? Should we say it with a French accent? Matei. 
Yeah, the two M names are Airman Matei and Airman Malin. Look at that. Hey, all right. So you were born in France. So your dad was French Navy. Did that affect you getting a clearance at all? Or is that pretty straightforward? Right on. So you were also, you were moved to Florida, dual citizen, video games. Did you like gym and working out in they don't work out, so. Yeah, hopefully you found a way to work out right now with uh, everything that's going on. All right, who's next? There we got Tran. Tran hasn't typed anything yet, it looks like, and Zellers. And then Sergeant Gaston, if you want, you can go ahead and just introduce yourself while they're typing. Sure. Sergeant Gaston. Sergeant McCormick after that since he's in here. Oh, got him. Yeah. So I like to play video games and... Lately, my hobbies have been just working on the house. Moved down here last month, so it is nothing. It's just getting everything the way the wife wants it. Work experience, I did a land mobile radio at Joint Base Lewis McCord for six years. Uh, during that time, I deployed. I went to Baghdad, Diplomatic Support Center. Great time. Went to about seven bases in Iraq. I uh, would do it over and over again. Like, it was the greatest experience I've had. Uh, married. No happily. kids. You said Catholic? I said happily. I did not oh. say Catholic. <laughs> I think I you're going with that, right? <laughs> yes, happily married. Um, yeah. Other than that, I am... You guys will be seeing me in class. I'm not Sergeant Cusker. Yeah. So on in the lab days, I will be in there. You will be my second sit behind. So it'll be an exciting time. All right. I'm going to go ahead and read Tran's thing here. He says his name is Tiger Tran. That's an awesome first name. He joined to serve and enjoy the sweet, sweet active duty life. He likes running video games and anime. He joined the Air Force because he thinks it's awesome. Okay. That's, that's honest. Oh gosh. Sorry, McCormick, you can go ahead and do your intro and then I'll read uh, Aaron Mallon's here. Okay. Uh, so I'm Technical Sergeant McCormick. I call home currently Keesler Air Force Base. Uh, I live in Biloxi in West Falcon. Uh, originally, I am from a small town in Louisiana called Houghton. Let's see here. My hobbies are video games, programming, reading, but mostly I hang out with my seven-year-old and watch really terrible cartoons. Um, I have a lot of experience with electronics. I've been in RF for about eight years now, so I've kind of worked on a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, most of the things that we touch in the schoolhouse I've worked on in a little bit. Uh, work experience, that covers that. Um, I went to DM for my first base, or Davis Monthan, in Arizona. I was in the base comm shop there, and our primary duties were to do PAs, which is Block 5, LMRs, which is also Block 5. And then uh, we did a little bit of HF stuff. And then... Uh, I don't know where I'm going after I leave here, and I am also uh, happily married, and <laughs> that's really about everything about me, I think. Yeah, generally that's we go good. wherever the military sends us. That's great, Sergeant yeah. McCormick. I think that was pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'm going to read Aaron Mallon here. He is from Augusta, Georgia. He's a ride or die Georgia Bulldog fan. I hope I said that right. I don't know what a Georgia Bulldog is. Maybe that's some type of animal I'm not aware of. I don't know. Um, I came into the Air Force because I went to college. Toxic friends and relationships made me want to leave. Also, my father is a master sergeant in the Army, so his convincing made me change my choice from Navy to Air Force. Okay, yeah, you made a good choice there, unless you really like sitting on the ocean. Bad football team. Okay. All right, so apparently the Georgia Bulldogs are a bad football team. All right, did I miss anybody? Oh, Zellers, I didn't get you, did I? 
Oh, perfect. Look at that. It's like he was reading my mind. All right, Sergeant Gaston, you got Sergeant Zellers, or Airman Zellers, excuse me. I just gave him a huge promotion there. All right, Airman Zellers is from New York. This individual enjoys video games, anime, and football. Two day computer science degree before coming to the Air Force. College is expensive. I get that. You do plan on finishing if you get base comp. Makes sense. Bit of time. Extra curricular activity. The district awards for smart students back in the day. What day was that? <laughs> How many years are we talking? I think it was a Tuesday. A Tuesday? Yeah. Third Tuesday Lots of things of I hear go day. down on a Tuesday. Hmm. Story. So I hear from a song anyway. <laughs> Put it in a song. It'll be true. Put it in a song. It's true. All right, Sergeant Young just snuck in here, so I'll let him do his intro real quick. Oh, or he won't do his intro because his mic. My mic's my mic was definitely muted on uh, the headset. Hi, I'm Sergeant oh, Young. Gosh. Whoa, dial it back, Sergeant Young. I um, I'm from Biloxi, Mississippi, originally, which is kind of ironic because I got stationed down here back in 2016. This is my home. Uh, hobbies, I play video games. I also watch anime, and I like lifting weights. Previous electronics, everything that I've learned up until this point in my military career, I guess you could con could consider. Yeah, I think you could consider experience. that. And then uh, I, I tinker a little bit with building PCs. So, but other than that, it's pretty. Um, yeah, just from what I've learned in the military so far. Could you put the slide back up? Oh, excuse I me. I, th I thought you had this memorized by now. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, my work experience. So, I've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I was stationed at, after leaving tech, graduating tech school back in 2012, I left for Langley Air Force Base where I was stationed at the, at the 10th Intelligence Squadron. We had a very unique mission there. It's not like what you'll see as far as RF is concerned very often in the Air Did Force. you work on computers? So we, we and were networking? attached to an intel unit, but we were a tertiary means of conveying information from downrange to the analysts that we supported. Okay. Can you talk and a little bit about a that? Lot of what, a lot of what we did with that, I can't really discuss because... Oh, right. Also, you're being recorded. So... Yeah. Yep. So, I had... Um, I had a TSSCI when I was there. There's a lot of the stuff that I did there that I'm not allowed to talk about, but there was a lot of really cool stuff. Primarily, though, as far as the RF equipment is concerned, I can talk about. I worked on fixed SATCOM. I have had limited exposure to working with the man pack radios, such as the PRC-117 Foxtrots and the Gulfs. Nice. I VHF, have... UHF. Yes, sir. And then I have a... A little bit of limited experience with 1x2 side oh, of the house stuff birthday. that I learned on my deployment. So, happy if you birthday, have any questions Bridges. about like fixed SATCOM things, um, I'm also qualified to teach blocks 7 and 8 if you ever have any questions on those later on down the road when you make it that far. Um, let's see, orders. Hey, I'm hold up, Sergeant Young, I got I, something really important that, for you. It's, uh, it's, uh -oh, Aaron, it's okay. Aaron Bridges' birthday. Is it? Yeah. Oh, happy birthday, Aaron Bridges. Oh, you're good. Just want to call him out. Uh, it's his 21st, and this is how you're spending yo, it. There's, yikes. I'll tell That's you what. My 21st birthday was spent in a desert in Iraq, all right? Drinking O'Doul's uh, yes. non-alcoholic beer, okay? <laughs> so I can't even get non-alcoholic beer. I, well, I was just gonna say if you if you have some time or whatever, I, I don't I, I don't know what to tell you. I guess you guys are trapped inside. Never mind. Not gonna suggest something horrible. You know what? All Stay right. safe. Kombucha <laughs> is a thing. Oh my gosh, you sound like those silly people that like to try and chug mouthwash whenever they don't have any access to alcohol. I would oh gosh. Recommend doing yeah, that don't way. don't do that. Also, remember you all are being recorded. Oh, correct. Yes, this is all recorded and will be posted. And will be posted in this classroom. Almost done with the intro. I oh. am married. Uh, we have a daughter. My wife and I got married in 2018, June. And we have a cat who 
has been sick lately. Uh, hopefully he'll get better soon. But other than that, I mean, if anybody ever has any questions about me or if they just ever want to know anything, feel free to ask. I'm an open book and I do not mind talking at all. About awesome. So we got, like I said, we got a bunch of instructors in here. Sergeant Gaston, he's going to be a new block two instructor for y'all. Uh, Sergeant McCormick, he's just kind of hanging out. He's a block six instructor. Uh, I don't know what other blocks you teach, Sergeant McCormick. Uh, I teach seven, and then I'm also going to be teaching the uh, Millstar course when it comes online, and okay. the uh, Fab T course. Okay, so he does block six and block seven, uh, and then he does the Millstar course and the Fab T course are five-level courses, those courses he's talking about. Uh, if you all can come back through at some point in your career, he'll be, hopefully he won't still be here. I don't know if he'll still be here or not, man. I really don't know. <laughs> with, with those courses don't specifically. Him. Yeah, I, I don't know. I Good luck. Anyway, <laughs> uh, like I said, Sergeant Gaston, he's the new guy in here, but he's going to hopefully be teaching this himself pretty soon here. He's very excited. Super excited. Super excited. All right. Super. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Thank you all for doing those intros. Again, happy birthday, Aaron Bridges. Sorry this is how you have to celebrate your 21st birthday, but at least you're not in a desert for six months so there's that all right uh so we're gonna do one alpha one alpha is going to identify basic facts about the capabilities and limitations of the hf transceiver the high frequency transceiver that's the amprc 150 or 160 uh in our schoolhouse we have both available so we have the 150s is what you will actually be getting to mess with in class on monday um and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this session here to kind of get you guys a little familiarized with that. Uh, Monday, we'll be talking about the One Bravo section, which is going to be the capabilities and limitations. So it'll augment kind of what y'all are going to learn in class and do in lab. So hopefully this helps y'all a little bit. Uh, but today we're just going to go over some basics. So as always, minimum 73% on the block test. That means you need to get 12 of the 15 questions correct. But our last class just kind of set that bar a little high. I think you guys can score a little higher, sort of set that bar a little higher. Maybe all 12 of you could, uh, or 10 of you, excuse me, could get hundreds. That would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, here's hoping. So as an RF transmission systems technician, you need to know the general capabilities and limitations of this type of radio. And this kind of goes for any radio you work on in your career, not just this radio specifically. Uh, why do you guys think you want to know the capabilities and limitations of a radio? Let's ask that question first. So let me ask uh, Aaron Chung. It looks like your microphone's working now. Um, can, any, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. I'm gonna okay. Turn um, volume down a little bit because you're coming in a little, little high for me. But go ahead. Um, I think it's just important because, so when we work on the radios, and also like when we advise Alec managers, we can like tell them exactly what the capabilities are used for, so people aren't going in with gear that like, kind of doesn't match their mission set or isn't sufficient enough to support their mission. Wow, I literally couldn't have said that better myself. Yeah, that's exactly it. You want to know what the radio does before you go into a mission or an exercise or anything of that matter. And you don't want to, like you just said, you don't want to bring the wrong radio to the fight, right? Make sense to everybody? Yes, sir. Cool. Yeah, yes, sir. Verbal responses are great, guys. I, I appreciate it. All right, there is a video here, and uh, we're not going to watch it. Because it's pretty terrible. It's from like the 1980s. And then this other video, I believe, is from like the 19... It might be even earlier than that. So I don't, I don't want to date it. But it's black and white. And it's pretty, pretty awful. Um, so I'm not going to subject you all to that. I don't know if y'all have access to that video or not. But in that video, they just kind of talk about some of the things we're going to go over in one alpha here. So we're going to talk about, first of all, what a radio wave is, uh, what its characteristics are. So what do you guys know about radios? Did you learn what a radio is? Anybody? Yes. Okay, yes. what is a radio? A radio is something that could uh, transmit information to another um, radio or component on the same frequency. Okay, another radio or a component on the same frequency. All right, how does radio wave propagation happen? 
Do you know? Has something to do with electrical current, that AC-DC going back and forth, something like that. Modulation, correct? That, that's that's part of it. We're going to get there. Sergeant Gaston, you want to help him out? Question being, how to... I like Airman Trans by sending out energy bubbles. Energy bubbles? Okay. What, like Mega Man? I'm down. He's not wrong. Yeah? It's like Mega Man, I guess. You gotta kill the Aqua guy first to get those energy bubbles. Alright. So, I believe to answer your question, the way it works is you've got some means of transportation. You give it some electrical current. You mm -hmm. inject some uh, intelligence that you're trying to transmit. Oh, intelligence. What's that, Sarn Gaston? Is that so like that how is, hard I think? It, it is. You. It's similar to like the beluga whales. Oh, so, God. Oh, yeah. so I should just start speaking whale like Dory? Yeah. yeah. Big one. Yeah. So, sticking to lesson principles. Well, sticking to lesson principles. <laughs> yeah, no, the intelligence, sir, would be the data or the analog or the analog data voice trying to transmit. All right, cool. Yeah, again with the language, guys, uh, I, I don't know how much I have to reiterate this, but uh, remember you are being recorded. This is getting uploaded. So you have to be professional, all right? Understood? Yes? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, a slip up every once in a while is okay, but just remember you got to be professional, all right? We're all in the military. All right. So we characterize a radio wave in three different parts here, or what makes up a radio wave in three different things. And I'm going to add some cool videos in here for you guys later that I found on YouTube that are kind of useful to watch. Uh, and they talk about radio wave characteristics and things like that. Uh, kind of a little bit better, I think, than the way some of the older videos we had did. And I'll post those up after this class is over. But so we characterize those three things. It's got amplitude, frequency, and wavelength. And before I move on to the next slide here, which obviously gives you the answers, does anybody know what these three things are? I don't know if you all talked about this in block one. I'm not super familiar with everything that goes on in block one. I've been trying to sit in there and learn everything. Yes, sir. We learned about this in Dolan. Okay, Aaron Bridges, you're good. It's it's okay. It's alright to have a slip up every once in a while. You're you're a okay. We're all human. We're all human beings. Alright, so you learned about it in Dolan, so I'm gonna go ahead and call you out since you just said that, Aaron Hubbard. That was you, I believe, correct? Uh I did not say it, but I Oh, do excuse me, know sorry, Han are. Hancock was the female. I apologize. Aaron Hancock. No, you're fine, too. Um, you want me to you explain pick, what each one, pick of, them one are? of them Oh, you want to do all of them? Sure, go for it. Yes, sir. So the amplitude is the magnitude of change in height of the radio wave, so the difference in height. And then frequency is the number of cycles within a periodic time, so how many times within a second normally. And then wavelength is the distance from crest to crest. Absolutely. Wow, that was great. It's almost like you read that straight out of the book. Yeah? I mean, if I have it pulled up, sir... <laughs> it's gonna... okay. If you guys have the book pulled up while we're going through this stuff, that's A-OK. -okay. I actually encourage that. I also have it pulled up. I tend to forget things at times as well, even though I've been teaching this for a very long time. All right. So like she said, we talked about amplitude. Here's an example of it for you, if you all can see the slides here. All right. So the amplitude is the magnitude of change in the height of the radio wave. Uh, they oftentimes associate with how much power you're pushing through the radio with how high the amplitude is going to be. Uh, if we're pushing a lot more power through the radio, you're going to see much higher waves with much lower crests like that. So from fall or rest is what they call it, from rest position to the crest, which is the top. So rest to crest is how they measure the waves actually as well or crest to rest, excuse me, other way around, vice versa. Uh, and then she talked about frequency and wavelength, so we'll do wavelength next. Uh, a lot of time I like to say wavelength is the length of the wave, brah. Like those people from California, they're out there, you know, doing whatever those California people do, talking about wavelengths. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. 
So what they're talking about here with an inverse relationship of frequency and wavelength, does does you guys understand what does you guys y'all understand what a inverse relationship is, first of all? Yes, sir. What is an inverse relationship? Why is Herman Hancock the only one responding? When one component uh, is increased, the other is decreased. Yeah, when one versa. component is increased, the other is decreased, just like in math. Absolutely. So how does that relate in frequency and wavelength here in this little diagram I have down here? I mean, I have the answer for you right here. When uh, frequency increases, the speed of light. That's wavelength. That symbol. That's lambda. So lambda is the Greek symbol that they use for wavelength. Uh, the speed of light is just that's the how you figure out what wavelength is. It's the speed of light divided by frequency in meters. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So right, you you almost had it though. Yeah, I, I get where you're going. So right, as frequency increases, wavelength goes down. So what does that mean for our wave right here, right? So we're looking at this shape. Would the shape go in as frequency increases, or would it go out? It would go in. It would go in as the frequency goes up. Yep, because the wavelength will get smaller. So as the frequency goes down, what's going to happen to that wavelength? Move out. Yeah, it's going to move out. It's going to stretch out. It'll be a lot further out on this uh, waveform here. So did you guys get to use the oscopes or the oscilloscope in block one? Yes, sir. Great. So one way to think of this is, uh, or to look at it, is physically using a device like that. And you can mess with things like this as you're going through and using that device. In our block, you're not going to get to do that specifically. But Sarn Gaston, if you want to kind of tell them a little bit about what they're going to do next week for the lab, that'd be great. Sarn Gaston. All right. Am I coming through now? There yep. we go. Sorry, my mic was... Yeah, just, just the lab that relates to this portion we're talking about right now. Yeah, so the, you guys next week will be using the CSM. Did anyone reach the CSM in their reading yet? Or any idea what it is? I don't know if they made it that far today. I got one person telling me they didn't even get to one Bravo. Ah, on fire. On fire. So, so the CSM is like 14 different instruments put into one and what you guys will be able to use it for next week is to uh you're gonna hook that up to the prick 150 which is our hf radio you're gonna be able to tune uh to some hf frequencies which would be in the am range as well as some fm in the hf range so it's pretty exciting stuff and you will do some test on making sure that the radio is able to transmit and receive as it should. So am I hitting on what you want me to hit on, Sergeant McCusker? You are nailing it. I'm just trying okay. to find them a picture of the CSM right now. Oh, I got you. So I can kind of augment this a little bit here. Yeah, so I, that did, should... I did show you guys the other day, if you were in there for the chat with Sarm Boudreau, what it looked like, but this is the one they had. This is the uh, Gucci model is like what we call it. This one starts at about 35 grand with no real features in it, the stock model. So if you can get these at your unit, awesome. We were not able to justify funding for one in my last unit, but we did have a similar one. Uh, a CSM or CSA is what you guys will see a lot in the field. It's going to be called Com System Analyzer or Communication System Monitor. And like he said, it's just an all-in-one device. So let me ask you, would you guys rather go up the side of a mountain and carry just this thing or about 15 different devices like y'all had to mess with in block one? Yeah, just the one device. Yeah, just the one device, right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a pain to carry all that stuff, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So that's why they made this. They developed this because it was getting to be such a, a pain, really. And they decided they could just smash all of these things into one piece of equipment. It's pretty awesome. You guys will see when you start using it. It's pretty neat. You can do some cool things. You can even turn a really expensive piece of test equipment into a commercial radio to listen to. So that's kind of cool. Y'all are going to get to listen to some, some AM or FM radio next week. Pretty fantastic. All right, so we'll move on to frequency next. 
like she said, Emma Hancock, you kind of nailed it. I uh, really did with these definitions. Great job. Uh, frequency, number of cycles completed by a periodic quantity of time. Often this is measured in something called CPS, cycles per second. That's how often it's going across the screen or how, how fast you're going to see it, how often it's occurring. Uh, the wavelength, the length of the wave, uh, that's what I say a lot. Hopefully that helps you all remember it. Um, that's, that's the easiest way to remember it is it's literally the definitions in wavelength. It's just how long it is. So how long between successive crests of the wave. And then we'll talk about propagation next. So not propaganda, propagation. All right. So propagation is the radio propagation is the behavior of the radio waves when they are transmitted from one point to another. So how do they get there? What are some methods you guys know? What are they doing right now? What does that look like? I know the antenna are not pointed directly at each other right now, and that's not really how these antenna would flow. If you were to uh, look at it here, let me see if I can draw on the screen here. Or is it line of sight and beyond line of sight? This, yep. So which one would this be right now? That'd be line of sight, right? It sure would be line of sight, but if you guys actually look at how these things are going, that would not, that's not how that would work. Doesn't it like the waves are sent to the ionosphere? And it bounces out the atmosphere and would go to the other. So for um, our block, yes. For this block, HF, we use something called the ionosphere. Absolutely. Very good. And that's what we're about to get into. So you nailed it there. Very good. It's like you knew what we we're going to talk about next. All right. Uh, with line of sight, like you were saying, line of sight is the, it's literally you can see the radio or the radio has what's called the radio horizon. So you don't have to optically be able to see it. And you guys are going to learn more about this in block seven. Uh, but you don't optically, like meaning with your eyes, have to be able to see where the radio is pointing to because it actually extends about 15% further than that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Sarah McCormick. You're good. Yeah, I believe it's about 15% further than optical horizon. Uh, and then 33% further, I think, than true horizon is what it calls it. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so that, that optical horizon, again, is it's what you can see, but... Like I was saying, the radio horizon, so you can set a device up on a tower and you can have it just because you can't see where the other device is that you have maybe at your base or something on the ground doesn't mean it's not going to radiate that far or get that far or reach it. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes. All right. So we talk about these layers of the ionosphere here, the uppermost part of the atmosphere, right? It's to make the online side communications possible. What are some things you guys remember from your text in regards to how this works, how we use the ionosphere for HF? Because I could scroll through the slides next, or you could just tell me, and it'd be a lot easier. Hopefully y'all got a chance to read this this morning. I gave you a little bit of time. So so we, we send low, f low frequency um, signals and low frequency signals? What do you mean? I mean, lower frequency signals. Like, like, what do you mean with lower frequency, though? You're still talking about H HF, right? Yes. Okay, so how about we replace the word lower frequency with the word HF? HF. So we okay. So we send high frequency signals. But go ahead, finish your definition, but but use the word high frequency. Right. Uh, so so high, we send high frequency signals uh, during during the night so that they can um, travel longer. Oh, okay. All right. I see where you're going with that. Okay. So what he's talking about is still HF, just so you all know. Uh, the HF range, the HF frequency range, extends from 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz, just so you all know. Now, that's not the HF frequency range for the radio you guys are going to be using. The HF frequency range for the radio you're going to be using is 1.6 megahertz to 29.999 megahertz. And you'll get more, we'll get more into that next week when we talk about One Bravo. Uh, but it is important to note that there, those are different. Okay. Uh, just make sure you guys know that. So what he is specifically talking about, though, here with this diagram, because I can kind of show you guys, because he said at night, right? We were able to use this band up here. I don't know if you specifically said this band, did you? No, but I should have. The, the okay. F, yeah, the we can use the F. Yep, we can use the F portion of the ionosphere up here, this layer that it breaks down into, either F1 or F2. And we can bounce, basically, is what it looks like it's doing. It bounces off of that and communicates much further. But at night, 
we have to use that lower end of the HF frequency range that we have to use between like 1.6 to 10 megahertz, basically, to to get any signals across at night. Nothing else is going to work because what happens is the ionosphere dissipates as the day goes on. So while frequencies down here like might be uh, might work better, like the D layer down here might work better during the day uh, at the high end of the frequency spectrum for HF. They will not work at night. They'll go right through the ionosphere and go right off and shoot into space. And we're not doing SATCOM with an HF device. Uh, that's just not possible. So don't don't think that's what's going to happen if it goes off into space, that we're still going to be able to communicate with that HF somehow. That's just not how it works. Okay? Why is it that it would, like, go straight through during the night? Is it just during the be day? Because like the... Frequency jamming? Yeah, so during the day... These these frequencies, the low frequencies, won't go through this, actually. The ionosphere layers down here, D and E, it will not go through those because it's ionically charged is what it's called. So from the sun, the sun ionically charges it, and it actually does a great job explaining this whole portion in y'all's study guy workbook if you have that pulled up right now. Does anybody have it pulled up? Yes. Because this, yeah, would, be, this would be a perfect time to go ahead and have one of you read that portion. You can go ahead and read that out loud. Is it, is it the uh, the ionosphere is the region of the atmosphere that extends Perfect. Keep from going. about 30, uh, 30 to 250 miles above the Earth's surface. It has several layers of electron, electrically charged gas atoms called ions. The ion arrangement is dependent to some degree upon the sun. Because of this, the conditions change as the time of day changes. The ionosphere, see figure three, yep. contains three layers, D, E, and F. Do you want me to keep going, sir? No, yeah, keep going. You're doing great. The F layer breaks up into two layers, F1 and F2. During the daylight hours, the D layer is ionized, ionized very strongly during the day, noon the strongest, and tends to restrict the lower HF frequencies from refracting efficiently higher HF frequencies. Okay. During the evening, the sun is down. The D layer has weaker ionization and the lower frequencies work well and higher frequencies do not function well. The D, E, and F layers are all responsible for H of long haul communications. All right, perfect. You, you, you can stop there. That's perfect. That was great. So you see what I was doing there as you were going through? Does what you said make sense now? Whoever was asking that question. Yes, sir. Okay. So like he was saying, the D layer is more ionically charged, is what they say, during the day. But what happens at nighttime, right? Based on what he just told us. What 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 do you guys know? What goes away during the nighttime? The sun. The, the sun. sun goes away. The sun goes away at night. Yeah, absolutely. We don't have the sun out at night. And there's no such thing as moon particles. Okay. That's just not a thing. We don't we don't use moon particles to charge anything, okay? I had a block one time tell me that moon particles are a thing. So I have like to tell the, you guys they're not. Like the sunshine uh, reflecting off the moon is that is that what they mean? Uh no, they were just losing their mind is what was happening. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about heterodyning next. Sarn Young, you in here? I am, sir. Sarn Young, you want to talk about heterodyning? Uh, sure. So heterodyning is considered to be the process of combining two or more frequencies. This will occur in our mixers. We'll talk about a couple of those later on. And this is done across a nonlinear device to produce new frequencies. Outputs are the sum, difference, and originals. So what's going to happen is you'll receive your first IF frequency. It'll encounter its first mixer, which is a fixed frequency on the transmit path. And then those two are those two signals are heterodyned to create your second IF. Yeah. So like I said, we'll discuss those things later. And then your difference is what's considered your lower sideband and your sum is considered your upper sideband. Oh, man. Those are like math terms, right? Yes. Getting that math adding on. and subtracting. Oh, adding and subtracting. All right, cool. Does that make sense to everybody, what he just said? Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes, sir. 
All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is AM. Uh, for the next couple slides here, we're going to be referring to AM. We're doing this because the portion after that, it, hi, hon. The portion after that, it talks about single sideband, and a lot of the characteristics and things we're going to talk about in AM do transfer over, and we want you guys to kind of understand why the radio we're using in class is better than the traditional AM radio that you can go buy at the store that they used to use to communicate on. So a 10 megahertz RF carrier, this is the example I give, is amplitude modulate with a 3 kilohertz intelligence. It'll generate two sidebands, the difference and the sum. So the difference, like Sergeant Young just said, that's the lower portion, and the sum, that's the upper portion. As you look at this on an oscilloscope, I'll go ahead and skip ahead a couple slides here. When we look at this on an oscilloscope here, just like you guys were looking at in block one, this probably looks pretty familiar for you. This thing in the middle here, that's our carrier, and it takes up about two-thirds of our total power there. And then this is our upper sideband, because the upper sideband goes to the right side of the spectrum, and the lower sideband goes where? The left side, sir. The left side, right? It's always going to be like this when you guys are looking at communications, okay? Anytime you're dealing with a lower sideband and an upper sideband, it's always going to be like this. Lower, meaning difference, will always be on the left. Upper will always be on the right, so you will always know that now. All right. Okay, so we'll go back to this example. Uh, both sidebands contain the same intelligence. That's one thing with traditional AM, with is which is why they started to make single sideband radios, because they realized it was a waste of power and a waste of uh, radio space, right? The bandwidth that it's taking up because they're transmitting the same thing on both sides of the spectrum, right? So, so they're just eliminating redundancy. Yeah. They're eliminating redundancy with this new radio. You guys are going to be using in class and stuff. And I say new, but there are newer versions of the radio out there. The 160 is the newer version or newest version of the radio, but the ones you guys use in class is very, very similar. Okay. But yeah, they're, they're eliminating the redundancy, and then they're going to do a couple other things here. We're going to learn about some of those advantages in a minute here. Very good, though. Whoever said that, that was outstanding. All right, so here they're just showing you the math happening. Uh, we'll get into that in a second here. So that's that, that 6 kilohertz total it's taking up there, right? Does that make sense to everybody? I know it's negative 3 and, or minus 3 and plus 3, but it's still 6 total. You're, you're aware, Sergeant Gaston. I don't understand. You sent a text that said, are you coming? Yeah, at 1237, man. Seriously? Yep. Oh, man. Yep. Never mind. Yep. As I was. As you were. All right. <laughs> All right, so the composite signal. It's the amplitude of the RF carrier. It changes to match the instantaneous amplitude changes of the modulating signal. The RF carrier has a representation of the audio superimposed in it. What does superimposed mean? Based on what you guys can visually see here, what do you think it means? Like a visually like a stacked where where the one where one yeah. object just covers it but doesn't fully uh, like illuminate it. Yeah, exactly. It's stacked on top of it, exactly. Very good. Exactly what he just said. Yep. So it's riding along this wave here, the carrier wave. Very cool. Again, what is Intel? What is intelligence? Uh, the information that's like passed between radio and... Yeah, what kind of information can that be? It's the binary from the generator. <laughs> okay. Okay. You just, you just like instantly went to that engineering level. I'm going to have to ask you to dial it back to the three level. So the, what's another word for uh, binary information, the ones and zeros that you pass? Right? So if I type in something text. on a computer, what's another word for information I'm passing from one place to another? Oh, data. Text. Data. 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 Text, yeah. data, data, data right. right? That's okay. So just remember what level we're at here, all right? Not everyone's at that same level. I I, I know every I know as much as anyone is. Okay. I just thought that's what you were asking. No, you're good. All right. So the intelligence, remember, is the audio or the data. That's what we're passing there. And like it's showing here, it's in the upper sideband and the lower sideband. It's exactly the same in both. So you guys see the upper sideband here, lower sideband here, this dotted line going across. The upper sideband is the one that's solid. All right. And then here's the carrier, the thing it rides in, meaning it's superimposed inside of that. 
This is the whole composite signal. Okay. So the carrier is transmitted even when no modulating signal intelligence is present. What does that mean? It'll yeah. continue to send out a signal even if there's nothing to send. Exactly. That's exactly what that means. Outstanding. And remember, this is only traditional AM we're talking about right now, not that new single sideband Gucci stuff. So both the lower sideband and the upper sideband are transmitted, even though they contain the same intelligence. Again, they're going to keep harping on this. Remember when they're saying this in these slides and in your book, they're talking about traditional AM. All right. So looking at this here, uh, nothing's really different than what we were just talking about. They just want you to know how much power each section is taking up. Uh, they have these things on the side. They're called guard bands. They're, they're a noise filter. So they give about 0.3 kilohertz on the side of each of the carrier there to kind of filter out noise. Noise is unwanted spurious signals or uh, audio or possibly like that, like a, almost like you're opening a bag of chips and you're like ruffling it around, that kind of thing. You don't want that coming across your microphone, right? I heard somebody eat a minute ago. Right, sir. Right. Or like that wind noise like you were just having in yours talking. Yeah, it's like that. So we, we develop things to filter out noise. That's what we do. Okay. Uh, everybody understands this? Any questions on anything we've gone over so far? No, sir. No, sir. No? Okay, cool. We're going to keep pressing then. I'm going to get you guys through this, all right? So our spectrum analyzer, this is a, just a plot of it again. We've gone to this a couple times. I'll probably come back to this again in a minute. Uh, but this is just to show you guys what that looks like. Cool. Don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, here's our summary of what we talked about so far. We talked about the intelligence creating the sidebands. It consists of a carrier, the upper sideband, the lower sideband, as we know them, the sum and the difference, respectively. So both sidebands have the same exact amount or the same intelligence, which is the audio or data. The sidebands will start from the center frequency, so that frequency in the middle, that, that carrier in the middle. Uh, the carrier does not change. It contains no intelligence, and it will transmit even if not modulated, which requires a bandwidth equal to two times the highest modulating frequency, which is a crap ton of bandwidth we're wasting right now. So you guys can kind of see why single sideband was developed, yes? Yes, sir. All right, cool. Does yes, anybody sir. need like a quick five minute break or anything before we move on to this next section? I'm good. Everybody else in class good? I'm good. good. Okay. All right, we'll keep pressing here. So we're going to talk about uh, single sideband next. And this is, this is something I've worked on at my previous base. So I have quite a bit of experience with these HF radios y'all are going to be working on in class next week. Sergeant Gaston's got some experience now under his belt. Uh, I don't know if he'd consider it a lot, but he's got some experience. No, Sergeant Gaston? You don't have any experience? Yeah, sorry. I was trying to transfer my mic. Yeah, got a little bit of experience. We can uh, definitely talk some theory. Awesome. All right. So moving on, so the upper sideband or lower sideband is one of the things that's going to be transmitted with the single sideband here. We're not going to transmit both anymore, so that's uh, definitely an advantage. And one of the things we're going to start talking about here is the advantages really of single sideband, right? So why do you want to why do you want to buy this new shiny thing, right? So it's like going from a Toyota Corolla to let's just say like a Ferrari or a Camaro, yeah. Is that car terms for y'all? Does that work? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. So you're upgrading, basically. So our primary use is for Beyond Line of Sight. Again, AM is still for Beyond Line of Sight. Don't, don't misunderstand that. The traditional AM, that's what they were still using it for. That's just, that's all they had at the time. Now that we've got this newer technology, it's, it's what we want to use, obviously. So with this being said here, we got this no signal in, no signal out thing. Does anybody know what this is kind of talking about here? Crickets. What is modulation, guys? Modulation is making it so that the um, 
not the carrier frequency, but the, the output frequency um, is good. It's supposed to be between 90% and 100, I believe. Okay, but but what it, what are we modulating? So you're, we're modifying the carrier wave with the intelligence wave. The intelligence, right? That's the thing I want you to harp on there, right? The intelligence. So if no intelligence is being sent in, no intelligence is being put out, does that make sense? Yes. So yes, if, sir. if yes, sir. I don't speak into my microphone, my microphone does not get what? Modulated, right? Any, yeah, modulated. It doesn't get modulated. Nothing comes in, nothing comes out. All right. Uh, some other quick things to note here. Obviously, it is single sideband. If you were to tell me that single sideband transmits both the upper and the sideband and the lower sideband, I'm probably going to nicely tell you to go check your notes. Because it's doing what? What can you see here on this diagram? It's only using the upper sideband. Right. Right now, it's only using the upper sideband. That's not to mean... Oh, my gosh. That's not to mean that you can't use the lower sideband as well. This is oh. just the example. All right. So, and this is our carrier. Note what's happening to our carrier here. It's not eliminated, but what is that word it's using? Suppressing. Suppressing, right? So you're in combat. You're doing suppressing fire. That's when you're firing so other people can move, right? Cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So we're going to talk about some advantages of single sideband next. Uh, we're going to talk about spectrum conservation or spectral conversations is what I've heard before. That's uh, talking to ghosts. Yeah. yeah. That's a joke for y'all. All right. So power efficiency. Tracking. Yeah, you're tracking. That's good. Light, like to keep it light in here a little bit. All right. So we got power efficiency next. We're going to talk about that. Effective gain and transmit and receive. Our total effective gain. How you get that. The peak envelope power or PEP. You know, because everybody's pepped up to be in here on a Friday afternoon. They're super excited, ready to get their weekend weekend started. Yeah. Of course, sir. All right. I like it. And then we got better signal to noise ratio. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is spectrum conservation. Spectrum conservation refers to the decreasing of bandwidth of each channel in a radio system to allow for more channels in the overall radio. It's the spectrum in our case. Okay. So the total HF spectrum is smaller, therefore channel spacing needs to be smaller. Let me kind of explain what this is talking about here. They're not saying we're getting more bandwidth because you're going to get whatever bandwidth your spectrum managers give you. Uh, when you guys go to your bases, you're going to have somebody called a spectrum manager. That's typically a previous RF trans troop who tra uh, transferred or reclassed into a separate career field called spectrum management, uh, where their entire job is to manage the spectrum frequency for the base. And they do that by talking to the FCC and other organizations. Uh, that's just the biggest one I can think of it. And getting frequencies from them. So before you go out on an exercise or before you go do anything with transmitting, you're going to talk to these guys and they're going to tell you, here's the frequencies you get. So if they're giving you a 3 to 30 megahertz range, right, which you're probably not going to get that much, to be honest, you might get like 20 to 30 megahertz and then just have to deal with it it will be better or more beneficial for you if you had an HF radio to use something that has single sideband because you would have more available channels to you, more available, and I don't want to use the word bandwidth necessarily, but you would have more efficient use of that bandwidth that you're given because you can transmit something on a single sideband radio on the same frequency. For example, we can use a 2 megahertz frequency on an upper sideband on a single sideband radio, and then we can also use that same 2 megahertz frequency on the lower sideband and transmit two different radios at the same time, and they will never talk to each other just because of the nature of how this radio works. Lower sideband cannot talk to upper sideband, upper sideband cannot talk to lower sideband, vice versa. Make sense to everybody what they're kind of talking about? All right. Cool. Do you all understand what bandwidth is? It's like the limit of frequency that you can use. Yeah, it could be the limit of frequency you use. Absolutely. It, it could be, uh, it, yeah, it could be the amount of frequencies you're given. Absolutely. Yep. The total amount or maximum amount you're given. Uh, what else can bandwidth be, Sarah McCormick? Is he still in here? Sarah McCormick? Yes. 
What else can bandwidth be? Bandwidth Besides be frequencies. It can be described as a, well, a bunch of things depending on the applications you're using in. Uh, in terms of a network, Boom. Uh, the amount of throughput you can what is push throughput? through a network. What is throughput? Um, how efficient Remember, these guys be? haven't been to block seven yet. Or six. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Everybody in the dorms has Boingo. And Boingo can only bring in so much information or so much internet for a better way a better way of saying it this is a good the, example into the uh dorms so everybody has to take a piece of that pie and the full bandwidth that let's say uh one of the uh dorms has would be a whole pie and you each get part of it so you get allocated an amount of bandwidth and then the use the using that bandwidth efficiently becomes more important uh, depending on the applications that you're using. Uh, an example of programs that use, like a program specifically that it's really bad about using network or uh, network resources efficiently would be something like Skype. It just uses a whole lot of bandwidth and doesn't give you a whole lot of dividends. Whereas something like Facebook Messenger or um, Google Hangouts um, uses the bandwidth and compresses the data in a way that uses your resources better. Wow, that's great. So do you guys understand what he's saying, basically there? That bandwidth can be either a total amount of data that you're given, or it can be the amount of spectrums that we give you. Or the amount is of spectrum that, space we give you. And networking, is that usually given out, like, uh, does it, is it a limit a day? Is it limited by day or by month? That would be crazy if they limited you by day. Or well, we're big organizations, I don't know. Well, think about like data caps, right? And you guys will probably talk about this more in block six and block seven, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But uh, if you have an ISP, right, like Comcast or any of those other ones, K1 is the big one here. If you go over your data cap, what do they do? They typically charge you more, charge you more money, right? Or they also do what's called throttling. Slow down. They throttle it, right, is what it's called. And they'll slow that speed down that you're allowed to have. Okay. Make sense? Yes, That's some more advanced stuff. You're going to learn that probably in about block six. Block seven, we talk about that kind of stuff. Is that correct, McCormick? Yes, sir. Perfect. I just wanted you guys right. to understand what bandwidth was. Okay. All right. And then this is a visual representation here of the spectrum space. It's like spectrum conservation. So look at how much more we were taking up with traditional AM, right? We took up that full six kilohertz. We're only taking up 2.7 kilohertz right there for a single sideband. So you have way more space available to you. All right, so we'll talk about power efficiency next. Um, this is a pretty obvious one. You're obviously transmitting less things, right? We're not transmitting this carrier here as much. We're just suppressing it and we're completely eliminating a sideband. Naturally, the radio is not gonna need as much power to push out that signal then, correct? Right. Yeah. So. What it can do, too, since you're not using all that power, is you can more efficiently push out the power that you are doing into that one sideband and carry it further. So then we have effective gain and transmit next. This one is just pretty much verbatim what it says in the slides here. I don't really have enhancements or anything extra to add to this, but it's the HF radio is inherent, uh, has more gain, efficient when compared to AM. It is a single sideband transmitter that can concentrate almost all available power into a single sideband, making this transmitter more efficient. It's, it's just more efficient for all the exact same reasons it was right here with power. You're doing less, right? You're putting out less, so you're more power efficient because or you have more effective gain, and then you also have more effective gain and receive for the same reasons. We're wasting less power, so your overall gain is going to be a lot less. Does it, it does it travel further? It, it can. If we put on a... Yeah, it, it I won't... I don't want to say it can travel further than an AM radio because if you put the wattages next to each other side by side, we we can technically make them both travel as far as we want them to, right? Right. Yeah. But it more efficiently uses that power. Now, I will say it probably takes a lot less power. Like, we would need a much bigger AM transmitter to transmit the same thing 
of on a single sideband. So the single sideband would need less of a um, uh, power amp is the word I'm looking for. And did you guys go into the classroom yet at all? Or are you going in Monday? Monday, sir. Okay. So Monday, 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 make sure it's hiring Gaston points out in the back of the room where the bass band is. And you'll see a big power amplifier sitting underneath of it. And he'll kind of, uh, hopefully he goes over this with you for like a second, if he has time to explain what this is right here. Yeah. I'll be sure to show him the base station. Yeah. So make sure you take a look at that. All right. So with effective gain and transmit, we obviously have better effective gain and receive. Uh, since there is noise present throughout the frequency spectrum, approximately half the noise is received with this bandwidth reduction. This gives the single sideband receiver an effective 3 dB gain. Now, here's a question for you. If I have 6 dB in transmit and 3 dB in receive, what do you think your total effective gain is? 9 dB? 9 dB! Yeah! Now, here's the follow-up question. Can you ever have... 6 dB and 9... Or can you ever have that full 9 dB? No. No, why not? You're correct. Now, why? Distortion? Nope. Think about it in terms of the radio is half duplex. If somebody else is transmitting, can you transmit? No, it, it goes one way. It goes one way. So if so, that person's trending, they're sending six dB of gain, right? They're using up six dB. So yeah, what? So, I so you're only using three. three. Yeah. So you're only okay. using three. Outstanding. Okay. Yep. And in this next slide just talks about your total effective gain. That's all your total effective gain is in almost all radio systems. It's your total amount of gain in transmit and your total amount of gain in receive, and that's it. That's what it is. All right. We'll talk about peak envelope power next. So peak envelope power or peck envelope power, which is what it says on one of the, the uh, little cards I misprinted one time. Peak envelope power is the transmitter's average power output during one RF cycle. It is a sample of the highest crest of the modulation envelope, so the highest point, that highest, that top part, the peak. So the signal is sampled in predetermined time intervals and measured, meaning we already know when we want to take a sample from it ahead of time uh, with whatever device you're using. For our instance, it'll be the CSM. So a 100 watt single sideband transmitter when keyed and unmodulated will have virtually no power out. Again, what does that mean? It says it right there. I can highlight it. Maybe that'll help people. What does that mean? I think that means that if um, it's unlike the standard AM that we talked about, so even if you are uh, transmitting but nothing is being pushed through, that it's not going to be developing that sideband. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It goes back to this very first slide we talked about here. Right? Y'all remember this slide back here? No signal in, no signal out. If you don't send anything, nothing happens. Oh, so, so e even though the carrier is suppressed? It, yeah, the carrier is suppressed. It's not taking up basically any power at all. Okay, I, I thought it was still being sent out. Like, like No, it's not. No, it's not. We actually have a separate mode in the radio called AME mode, amplitude modulation equivalent, where you do send out a small portion of that carrier, but even then it's still not taking up that two-thirds of power like it did in the traditional AM radio. Great question, though. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. So then we have better signal-to-noise ratio next. We talk about the bandwidth is less than half of an AM. So less than half of the amplitude modulation. Um, our signal-to-noise ratio, do you guys know what that is? Like how much gain we're getting through, how much signal is actually getting through the radio versus how much of that is distortion, right? How much is uh, noise or the unwanted um, spurious signals, basically, coming through the radio? So they're saying we're having, yeah, it makes sense, right? Because we're transmitting less. It would make sense that we're cutting it in half. We're not using that two-thirds of power from the carrier or that one-sixth of power from transmitting both uh, or a, another sideband that we would have been using. So the overall noise is reduced because the other sideband is eliminated. It's not there. All right. Any questions so far? 
No, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to put you guys on a quick, take a quick five minute break, uh, and then we'll come back, all right? Yes, sir. Yep. Unpause this recording. All right. So we talked about radio wave characteristics, propagation characteristics, heterodyning, amplitude modulation, and some single sideband characteristics. Uh, we talked about the advantages as well. Uh, next, we're going to kind of get into uh, capabilities and limitations specifications. So we're going to talk about like CCI, um, things like that. Does anybody know what CCI is before I pick on Sarn McCormick or Sarn Gaston? Other than what it says on the screen right now, right? Like, because obviously it's a radio has the capability to encrypt and decrypt the radio signals. Okay, it's going to obtain the classification you load into it. Uh, the guidance is somewhat vague. And it's generally understood this equipment will never be left unattended. All right, other than that. I have no personal experience with that. Okay, nice. perfect. Sar McCormick, what you got for CCI? CCI? In respect to... Yeah, because you don't want to go to jail. Oh, uh... Just CCI in general. It doesn't have to be in respect to Block 2. Okay, so CCI, uh, different points in your career, you could interact with equipment that is marked CCI. Treat that equipment like it could ruin your career. Or you're going because, to go to jail. Yeah. Or that. So, uh, treat it carefully. Uh, and make sure that you have positive control over it at all times. If your name is on that piece of paper. Because yep. you don't want to be responsible for what happens if that, uh, let's say, uh, keys get lost. Or oh, gosh. the key loader gets misplaced. You don't Put in a shredder. Yeah. You don't. You don't want that. That's that's the smoke you don't want. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, yes sir. sir. <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, we don't want to go to jail. All right. So when we're talking about CCI in regards to our radio specifically and the block two portions, thank you, Sarmacor. By the way, I appreciate it. But when we're talking about CCI in regards to our radio, the HF radio, we have something called embedded crypto in there. And we're going to talk more about that next week when we get into the guts of the radio and actually go into 3-alpha, which I don't know if any of you all started reading through 3-alpha yet, but don't worry. Next week, we're going to actually sit down and go through it, and I'll teach you guys how the insides of the radio work probably a little bit better than just sitting there and reading through slides will do for you. Um, and reading the TO, which can be a little dry at times, but is useful. So our radios are considered CCI because they have that embedded crypto in them. Embedded meaning it, it doesn't come out, right? It's not going to come out of the radio. Uh, these radios are about $19,970 something dollars a pop. Uh, we have about 12 of them in class. So they're very expensive. And if you misplace one of these radios or lose one of these radios, you're probably going to be getting in a lot of trouble. Uh, might be doing some jail time, especially if it was loaded which means has crypto in it. Uh, what do you guys think is the classification of the radio if I load a secret key in it? Top top secret? Why would you say top secret if I told you I loaded a secret key in it? Oh, so it's just secret then. Secret? Is it just secret Correct. classification? Correct. It's just secret classification. Remember what it says okay. here. It's going to obtain whatever classification is loaded into the equipment. Sergeant Gaston, what is something unique about loading classification? Something unique about holding classification. Yeah, what happens once I go to a higher tier of classification? Oh, you just upped your classification of the radio. So if you started out with secret, now you're throwing TS on it. But what happens yeah. if I load a, a secret key on there again? Is it st is it going to go back to being a secret radio? Uh, no, sir. Once you put in your TS, it's now a TS right? item. So everybody heard that. If you load TS key into a radio and then... Later, you use that same radio to load secret key. It's always going to obtain whatever that highest classification level was. So treat it that way. And that's what Sergeant McCormick was kind of touching on a little bit. Like, don't don't lose your keys. Don't lose your your crypto devices. Don't don't erase your stuff. And and that's what this guidance is somewhat vague part kind of means here too. Y'all are going to have something called a comsec office at your bases. Pay attention to what they tell you. 
Because if they oh. tell you if they tell you something's due at a certain time or you need to do an inspection or whatever, make sure you pay attention to that. All right. Go ahead. Somebody had a question. Um. So, it, would there be any way to take the top secret off? Would that change the clearance of the um radio or? It, if it's Not on unless your comsec office approves that. You can always zeroize the radio, right? But once you designate something as being that classification level or that thing, you're usually going to slap a sticker on it, and that device is, is treated as if it was TS or a secret, even if it's not what? loaded. Sir, why do you think that protocol exists? Because lots of people have done lots of dumb things over their career um, with keys in regards to that. And uh, okay. the, the mishandling of things like that. That's what I think. Um, Sergeant Gaston, Sergeant McCormick, you got anything to add on that? Sergeant Young, you're in here too. I know your wife works ComSec, Sergeant Young, so you could probably speak a little bit more to that. I'll give him a minute. His mic might be off again. Ah, uh, got me. So if you were to have an encryption device, a the most common one that I've seen and used throughout my career is like a simple key loader. Ooh, and what's a simple key loader? More- it is an encryption device that houses all of your encryption. It's a fill device, rather. Um, you go to base comsec, you get issued your comsec, and then they put the communication security encryption keys on that fill device. You then take that fill device to whatever system, in this case, radios, that you would like to load that encryption to, and then you interrogate the encryption device or the the encryption off of the fill device onto the radio and then use that encryption or use that encryption and assign it to whatever channel you're trying to program and encrypt to talk on. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarnia. Appreciate it. You're welcome. But if you are to lose. Oh yeah. You can probably talk about that because your wife works the, his wife works the complex side of the house. So he can tell you guys a little bit more about what would happen if something happens. If you were to lose encryption, we're talking about even keys, low, correct? Even yes, if you're yes, so if you're to lose encryption keys that are loaded onto a full device, say you lost that whole device, you're going to jail. That you're going to receive a lot of paperwork, uh, probably reduction in grade before they separate you, depending on the severity of it. Because if that encryption falls into adversary's hand, they can then use that encryption to encrypt their communication devices to intercept our transmissions, which are no longer secure, potentially. Absolutely. And if they can listen to us and they can listen in on, like, troop movement, things of that nature, that's a huge deal. And ComSec is viewed as being a very, very touchy subject. So yep. it's best that's... that you just maintain positive control over all types of encryption encryption devices your keys your radios all of it they keep saying positive control do you guys understand what they mean by positive control like under surveillance line of sight line of sight line of sight (laughs) under constant surveillance okay yeah see i think we just scared y'all a little bit line of sight always yeah don't 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 (laughs) yeah don't don't stare at your safe okay all right let's let's talk a little bit about that then sorry young can you kind of tell them a little bit more about that as far as um, uh, maybe securing it and positive control TPI. Right. Okay. So anytime, anytime you're going to open up your safe, you, there's a form that you have to fill out that is logged with your base comsec office. I think it's monthly. They check all the logs and the, uh, the safe checklists and everything like that. But there's a routine that you have to do where you'll go unlock the safe sign a piece of paper with your initials the time that you opened it up. When you take things out, you have to put them back. And then at the end of the day, you have another checklist where you have to make these nice little neat X's inside of the boxes that you're not allowed to draw outside of. And if you do, then it's right up. And you have to make sure that every piece of equipment that is accounted for on your sub account is in front of your face. Serial number one three five six seven four. Go over to the paper. Serial <laughs> yep. number one three five. That is six, exactly. Seven, four. Yeah, like, exactly. And then, and whenever you're closing the safe, you have to close it. But then somebody else who is also cleared to operate that safe has to come up and say, "Okay, this this safe is in fact closed. Move the handle to make sure it doesn't open." And then they also have to sign that it's closed. 
it's pretty extensive. But there's a lot of other places that I'm sure have way more precautions and like procedures in place to safeguard. I, I've never really messed too much with anything above like um, SCI. So I mean, yeah, I've only done TS SCI. I can't talk about the other stuff I've done. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there are higher classification levels though than TSSCI, from what he's what he's telling you guys. So just keep that in mind. All right. There's higher levels in top secret. Yes, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay. So all right. No, you're good. <laughs> all right. So that the whole point of that wasn't to kind of scare the crap out of you guys, but just to kind of to reiterate the point that you should take crypto items seriously, no matter what it is. I mean, if for example, something as simple as a flag. Like when I told you guys I worked at White House Communications, we had a flag that cost $10,000. That was considered uh, a controlled cryptographic item because it was a $10,000 flag. We had to literally put that in somebody's room for the night when they went to bed. Like it wasn't allowed to be anywhere else. We had to have positive control of it like they were talking about the whole time. You know, I, I freaked out at one point during one of my first couple trips to the point where I was like setting alarms on my phone every three hours to wake up and uh, check on the flag. To make sure it was still there. Now, it didn't move, right? It's a flag. It's not going to get legs and get up and walk away from you, right? I should have just trusted that I had positive control of it. So, that's, I, that, I you guys you understand? Do you all understand what we're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Cool. All right. So, this next portion... Um, we're going to go to your ops manual. You guys have your ops manuals in front of you, your TOs, or your technical order. Uh, you can use either the intermediate maintenance manual, or you can use the uh, operations manual. I would prefer if you use the operations manual. I went to page 1-3, or PDF page 26. And uh, I want somebody to just kind of tell me what you found on that page, and whether you type that into the chat here, or you verbally tell me. Just one of the things that's not on the page right here. Uh, that'd be great. And I'll wait. I do want to know about this radio and water, that specifically. I would love to know how much water you can put this radio in. Whoever that is was just trying to talk, you might have a better time typing. Yeah, the HF tech, tech manual, Airman Tran. Absolutely. 35.4 inches of water. 35.4 inches of water. Now, do me a favor, Airman Hancock. Does that say the word submersion or immersion next to it? That says immersion, sir. Immersion. What do you think immersion means? Uh, like, sitting? Or sitting, yeah, yeah, like quickly taking a dip, right? There's a yeah, so remember that with all radios, really, no radio is really uh airtight, air sealed when you're going down and diving or going underwater with, okay? So keep that in mind for, for, for starters here. Um, the difference between the word immersion and submersion is immersion means not fully underwater. It means part of the radio fell in the water or whatever. You dropped it in an embankment of snow, whatever happened, and you quickly pulled it back out because you realized what you did, right? Or you've got this radio in your backpack, in your man pack, which is one of the configurations y'all are going to learn about in One Bravo. You're running through some uh, some water, some jungle terrain, whatever. You got you got to walk through some water real quickly. You're going to be okay, all right? In 35 point, what, four inches of water, like she told me. Now, any so, any more than that, you're going to damage the radio. Because submersion means completely putting the whole thing underwater. Sir, if it's out, of, if it's out in the rain... And it's pouring, Do not leave these radios out in the rain. These are not, not meant for that. You will keep these in a tent or something secure. Now, you can leave your amps out in the rain, stuff like that. Like your antenna coupler, your antenna itself... Uh, things like that are sure you can have those outside, but I would not leave sensitive components out in the rain. Uh, second of all, what is this radio again? We just went over it. It's CCI, right? It so, you're, so you're not going to leave it out in the rain, right? Well, you would be standing 
right? I, I know you're yeah, yeah. Even if you're standing right next to it operating, yeah, sure, sure. You have that positive control. You're still not going to take it out the rain. Yes, sir. Okay. You can cover it. Like, you can put it in a backpack and cover it, or you can cover it and use it outside in adverse conditions, sure. But, yeah. You, you don't want to, like, leave it out for long periods of time in the rain. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, is the, uh, just to go back on yeah. the keys question, are the keys, like, software, like, like are they, like, uh, downloaded into the radio, or what are they? The are keys? They keys. Oh, go ahead. Sergeant Young. I'll wait, London, I'll wait till your microphone stops doing yeah, whatever it's yes, doing there. Me. All right. Sergeant okay. Young, you, yes. uh, you want to kind of take that question he just asked? You want to repeat your question again? Sir, I said, uh, what, what are keys? Are they physical or are they software keys? Are they downloaded? No, it's, radio? it's digital. So basically it's... Well, anymore it's a, it's a digital key. Right. So it's it's a, it's a type encryption is basically an algorithm that is compatible with whatever type of radio that you're using that is specifically used to encrypt your audio or your data that is being sent across that. Now, when you think of encryption, you can't think of it as like, okay, so if we have two radios, one of them's encrypted and the other one's not, and we were to talk try and talk to each other on the same frequency, you would still be able to hear something, but the words wouldn't be intelligible, if that makes sense. So when you're loading the encryption to the radio, the radio then uses whatever fill device is hooked up to it, and it pulls that encryption off of that fill device, and then on the radio itself, you then assign that encryption key to whatever channel it is that you're trying to encrypt. So it's all digital in nature. There's really no like physical representation of the key other than what you can see on the screen on the fill device oh, or on okay. the radio. That's okay, awesome. Now, you. now I'll give you a back in my Air Force story. All right. Well, back in my Air Force, right? So <laughs> <laughs> that back when I came in about 12 and a half, almost 13 years ago now, we had paper tape. Uh, obviously, paper means it's physical, correct? Oof. Yeah, oof. We had you paper tape, and I had something called a Koi 18. And it was the bane of my existence oof. at my first base. So what I had to do with this piece of paper, it was literally a physical piece of paper with hole punches in it. It looked like a little kindergartner attacked a piece of paper. That's what it looked like. And it had different hole punches in it, and I pulled it through a device called the Koi 18. And uh, hopefully, if it went A-OK -okay the first time, I loaded all my crypto. If it didn't, I had to keep doing it repeatedly to load crypto. It was it was pretty rough. So y'all don't have to do that no more. Which is great. Yeah, yeah. All right. So moving on. That was great. Thank you for pointing that out. Um one of the things I want to touch on is just remember where that table is at, the one you guys are looking at, the one she found that immersion on. There's a lot of great information on there. Uh, come test day, I highly recommend you guys familiarize yourself with the locations of these tables and this information that's listed below. Uh, the frequency range for single sidebands on there, the FM range, the HF range, these are not things we need you to memorize. These are things that are located in your TO, and they're things that you can look up on test day, right? So you will have access to TOs. You will not have, I think, nearly as many TOs as you all have for the Block 1 test. I don't know how many you have, but I think you have way more than what we're giving you. You're only going to have this TO, uh, the Intermediate Maintenance Manual, which is your other one. And then you're going to have uh, a TO for the CSM, and you will have your circuits and diagrams. And that's it. All right, this is the table that you will see on this page, on page 1-3. It has all that information, like I just said, so we don't need to keep going over this. You all can just take a look at it at, at your own leisure. Just familiarize yourself with the location of this table in your TO. These are some things that are listed on there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about modes next. So we're going to go ahead and talk about fix, hop, ALE, 3G, and 3G+. And now that's hop as in frequency hopping, not hop as in like the Easter Bunny is coming to visit you and it's hopping up and down. All right. I'll take that as a yes. 
Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> so the silence is killing me. All right. So fixed is the starting mode that you all are going to see on Monday morning when you go in and you start programming with starting gas down there. Uh, that's the normal operating mode for the radio. That's where it's going to be. You can program channels 000 to 199. However, I don't recommend you program manual channel 000. Typically in the maintenance world, which is what you guys are going to be in as RF transmission systems techs, you're going to use this 000 channel to perform maintenance. You're, you don't want to occupy it with something else. So, for example, if a commander comes to you on an exercise and has this HF radio or another radio and says, hey, can you quickly check out if this frequency is working for me? I don't I don't know if it's working or not. You know, you want to have that manual channel 000 available to you to quickly program that by hand. You don't want to have to go back into your computer, open it up, load all your keys, do all that stuff. You want to be able to quickly check the frequency. But if you had it preoccupied otherwise with a frequency or with a saved preset, or is what it's called, or a channel preset, then you wouldn't be able to do that. You'd already have that position occupied. Make sense? Yes, sir. All right, so there's 200 available channels to you. I know I said 000 to 199. Obviously, that adds up to 200, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you have 75 presets is what they're called. And the presets are things that you can save channels and programming into. So we have this feature called scan. Um, sorry, Gaston, have you done any exercises where you have to scan things? I uh, haven't had to do that with a HF radio, but I did have scan. You want to talk a little a... bit about that? Yeah. It, does it, is it the same as scanning like, uh, is Trump scanning, stuff? man? All right, so you can program different frequencies to have a scan. So in the land mobile radios that I worked on, uh, we would put a scan list inside there. And so essentially what it would do is it would allow a radio to monitor different frequencies. So you might be on uh, 1.6.25, but you could also hear frequencies 5.2 and 5.75 and just allows you the capability to hear multiple things. Oh, uh, what happens just, if you uh, program your scan rate for only like, you know, two seconds or three seconds and your commander wants to quickly key up? If All right, can you repeat that for me real so quick? So what happens if you're programming those LMRs, like you said, and you give your commander or the individual with that scan rate, you give them a scan rate of like two or three seconds, what happens with that? So let's say they hear okay. something, they want to respond to it, and you only... Too fast. That, he's got it exactly right there. Yep. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. The way that they were done is like they tried to trans... Then would take over that channel regardless of where he was at. I'm sorry, I was trying to understand. Yeah, that's if they have the override, the emergency button on. If you program the emergency button, that'll override it. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm... No, you're good. This radio is very similar. Yeah. Yeah, scanning is scanning. What's a, what's a good unit? Like a 10 seconds or is that too much? Uh, 10 seconds to 20 seconds is usually pretty good. So think about it in, in this way, right? So you're doing an exercise and you have all kinds of traffic coming across, right? Like so planes are being loaded. You have CE working. You have cops running the base doing their thing. Uh you're doing your own thing as a comm troop, right? So you might have calls come across just asking you to come fix something because it might be easier to reach you on a radio than it might be to call you, right? You could be out in the field working on something and they might need you to get that immediate contact, right? You might not have a cell phone on you where you're at. You might have a radio though. It just depends. So yeah, 10 to 20 seconds. You just want to think about what they need to use it for. And it, it also depends. Like You don't want necessarily... You don't want a radio that has everything. Yeah, because, never give a commander everything. <laughs> because if they... The way the scan's going to work is it's just going to be jumping. And so it, at a standard base, Sergeant McCusker was saying you're going to have a lot of traffic, and that, that is true, but you need to have traffic that pertains to you. Right, so if your commander's a comm commander, don't give him the cops and all those other people. He doesn't need that. And you'd also get in trouble because they talk about stuff that the average public can't have. So sure do. Law enforcement, you have to get that approved. Just what a great point. 
so you can get reprimanded for handing him. Absolutely, you can. You're not gonna immediately jump to a reprimand, all right? In the real world, like that's not gonna happen. Okay. Well, just feel free you're you're gonna get verbally talked to, all right? Look, the way it works is if you repeatedly do the same thing wrong over and over again, then yeah, you might get a reprimand. Okay. That's good to know. People make mistakes, right? We're all humans, right, Bridges? Yes, I, feel, sir. I feel like he's, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. Yeah. It's not that sick. You're good. All right. So we'll talk about fix next uh, after we're talking about scanning. So fix single sideband scan. Like he was just saying, the scan mode is exactly that. You'll program these channels. This is a lot easier to do with something called CPA. That's a um, communications planning application. That's the program we use for programming these radios. Uh, on a computer and usually the scanning feature is way easier to program on there um, You can do it manually by hand. Uh, we don't teach you guys how to do that in class But you will definitely do this in block five. I believe you learn how to scan through radio channels um, I don't know if we have any block five instructors in here No, nobody's speaking up if they are all right so yeah, Block 5 with the LMRs, you, like he was telling you guys, you will learn how to do the scanning. I assume you learn how to do it in Block 5 anyway. But for our purposes, we just want to talk about it. So this is what it does. It includes upper sideband, lower sideband, and FM mode. Uh, it's for HF, VHF scanned together. So we have the 1.6 to 59.9999 megahertz range. That is the full frequency range for the radio. So keep that in mind, right? So we go a little bit beyond the HF range in our radio. We can do a small, small portion of the VHF range, which extends from 30 to 300 megahertz. Who, who would we be contacting with that kind of frequency? So you're going to be using FM mode uh, with that frequency. So the 20 to 59.999 range, you're you're most likely going to be talking to aircraft, sister services, um, those kind of people. That's That's what it's going to be used for. Yep, and most likely during an exercise, you'll see that. You'll see that capability be used. Yes, sir. Yeah, cool. I mean, I hope most of you get to do exercises. Nobody really talked about what base they're going to yet or anything, but we can save that for the end if you guys have bases yet. But we'll save that for the end, all right? No, sir, we haven't gotten our bases. Okay, well, here's hoping you all get something great. If not, welcome to Keesler. Hope you enjoy your stay. All right, uh, let's talk about hopping next. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about hopping next, right? So that's not jumping up and down, like I said, like the Easter Bunny. That's physically, rapidly switching channels, rapidly, very quickly. Uh, it's a measure of ECCM, or electronic counter countermeasure. I know that's a mouthful right there, but that's what it is. All right, uh, it's a transect technique. That's your transmission security. There's a bunch of other transect techniques that you all are going to learn about when you get to your different bases. Like it says, frequencies constantly change. Uh, it is used for anti-jamming, and it has a special setup timing requirements that you're going to learn about in Block 3. So with the frequencies constantly changing, I want to talk about that real quick. If somebody programs in one wrong frequency or the wrong frequency in the list at all, they're not going to be able to talk to the people who are hopping around. All right, That's, that's just the thing. It's not going to work. It's not like it's going to be like, oh, yeah, we're working 9 out of the 10 frequencies we got. Like, no, there's no 90% working with the radio. That's not a thing. Okay. Any questions on this? No, sir. Perfect. All right. I know Actually, I'm sir, I do have a question. How yeah. do you sync up with someone when y'all are both frequency hopping? So hopefully they have the uh, exact same stuff programmed in as you. Yeah. And also you use something called time of day, word of day, multiple word of day. And those are things that, like like it said specifically here, you're going to learn about in block three because you actually get to do that. Okay, thank you, Sam. No problem. No problem. All right, so with the hopping, it talks more about it in your ops manual on table 1.1. Uh, it doesn't function like the traditional ECCM. It's still an effective in preventing... I know the way they were this, it always sounds like it's still ineffective. It's still N effective in preventing jamming of transmissions. So the way people sometimes read that, it's not ineffective. It's N effective, okay? So it only hops on program, pre-programmed channels. Like I told you, you have to program those channels correctly. If you don't, you're not going to be talking to those people. That's what it's talking about. It must be synced up. 
Uh, only hops on HF frequencies, 2 to 29.999, meaning you can't use the full spread spectrum of the radio. And it uses the frequency hopping time of day, right? So you have to have the correct time of day in there. And that's something you'll learn about again more in Block 3. Any questions so far? Perfect. I know I'm going through these last kind of slides pretty quick here, but I'm trying to get you all done by three here. All right, so we have this thing called hailing a hop net. This is for when someone is actually in a hopping, like she was saying, actually. If two people are talking in a hop net and one person is not in that hop net, there is a specific designated frequency that they can go to to talk to these people. They can hail them, meaning they're saying, hey, what's up, man? I'm trying to say something to you. But uh, obviously you're jamming me right now or you're in a hop net and I can't access that. They can go to that frequency, quickly hop out of it. Now, one thing to remember is if you're in a hop net and another radio is in a hop net and this third radio that you're talking to is not in that hop net, one, don't tell them what your hop net frequencies are because why? Why do you guys think that is? You might not know who they are. You might not know who they are. That's a great point right there, right? You don't know who they are. You know? You have no clue. All right? Uh, second of all, why else? Are you in a secure mode anymore? Are you in an ECCM mode if you hopped out of a hop net to go talk to this person? No, whoever said no. No, you're not. Right? So keep that in mind. You don't want to be talking about stuff that you shouldn't be talking about. All right? Passing frequencies on a radio, big no-no in, in RF. Just so you guys know, every single radio person in this channel right now will back me up on that. All right, don't pass frequencies over the radio. Don't do it. Even if it's during an exercise, you go to that person physically and you give them what they wanted. You don't, you don't just hand off frequencies. All right, so ECCM has to be programmed. Channels to monitor the hailing channels. You have to program those channels ahead of time. All right, they're not just going to be in there. Uh, then we'll talk about this ALE thing, but I think I'm going to hand this off to Sergeant Young here because he does a pretty good job explaining ALE here. All right, so automatic automatic link establishment, as it says in the slide, utilizes a specialized radio modem to automatically control an HF transceiver to establish the highest quality communication. With. Essentially what we're going to do here is, because back in the day, whenever you were trying to develop what you see is link quality analysis, and that is done through sounding an exchange. You had to ping the ionosphere essentially to determine how saturated it was and what type of link would be best when trying to communicate with your distant end or your series of radios that you had set up for your network. An automatic link establishment does that function, but automated so it automatically pings the ionosphere and compiles a it compiles a table through link quality analysis to determine which channels are best to communicate on yes okay yeah Do you have anything else to add to that, Sergeant McCusker? No, I think you got it. Okay. All right. You talked to them about the LQA? Uh, a little bit. Link quality analysis, just the uh, – not not a whole lot, not in depth. Let me see this with the Ailey. Yeah, if you could just kind of explain the table real quick. Right, so the table is the quality, so that's the LQA scoring that was given for each channel per radio. So you see in radio 2, the quality of the channel was rated at a 74, and then for radio 3, it was at a 51, radio 4 was at a 96. So based on this LQA scoring chart, which, would, which channel would you all, as the class, what would you say would be the best channel for all three of these radios to communicate on? Oh, I would love to see these responses. Probably. I love this Aaron Bridge is down here going, no sir, jail time. Probably channel three. Right, channel three, because those have the highest average scores, right? Right. Yep, R3, so R3 guys. Well, no, no. So, no, 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 no. Don't misunderstand. R3 is radio three. He asked you what channel. 
you're not going to pick channel, a specific right. radio, guys. Those radios are doing that regardless if you want them to or not. Right. You don't pick a radio. And that's the automatic. And you don't do anything that. anyway. This all happens rapid. Yep. All right. Pretty good. No, no questions on this so far? Okay. All right. These next couple slides are going to be pretty quick. So ALE uh, has a couple different versions, basically, that are out there. We have the third generation, which is this faster linking ability to operate successfully in lower signal noise ratio, which is great. If you're in an environment where you have uh, a lot of noise, a lot of static, or a lot of electronical interference going on, electronical, nice, a lot of electronic interference going on, uh, you can you can still use this 3G mode, okay? And these are all modes of ALE, like he was just talking about. So they're 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 already doing that LQA, all of that stuff in the background. So we got that 3G plus. That's another one, right? That just means third generation plus. It allows the radio to receive and place ALE calls while operating in 3G. And then we have these techniques here, which I'm going to have Sarn Young explain again. I'm calling you a new bunch, Sarn Young. Oh, no, you're good, sir. Uh, ALE, modes of ALE sounding, is when one radio sends a sounding signal on all channels to in a channel group. Receiving radio then develops the LQA score, but it does not send a response. So What's that example I like I got, to give, Sarn Young? I got this really good example. Yeah, from, go ahead. Uh, Sergeant McCusker. Go ahead. Where, where, where you're looking at another person and you're like, suh. And then they don't say anything back, and they just kind of look at you with that awkward stare, like, man, I don't know you, whatever. And they leave. They just leave. That's sounding. But then exchange is whenever you walk up to somebody that you know, and you're like, suh, dude. And then they're like, suh. That's that exchange. Radio's transmitting a signal and receiving it in return. And right. then through that, they develop the LQA score. Very good. Does that make sense to y'all? We tried to put that in airman terms for y'all. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very good. I, I use the uh, example of sending know, a... Uh, a oh, you guys are allowed like to laugh. That's fine. <laughs> I, I use the example of sending a text message to somebody you haven't met yet. And you're like, hey, how's it going? And then they don't send you anything back. And you're like, oh, all right, cool, ghosted. That's rough. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I like to use. You got to keep it hip. All right. So this used to show the actual sounding happening it's literally just this radio one going sup radio two three four and then they send nothing back and it's like all right cool man and then exchange is literally them sending stuff back but that doesn't work when i have this pulled up in pdf uh, if you guys have powerpoint on your uh desktops or computers that you have at home to pull that up it'll show you that it's just a little animation they added in there so the other modulation waveform we'll talk about is AME. This is a suppressed carrier with only USB. We talked about this earlier. I think somebody said they were reading about this earlier, and I kind of helped explain a little bit better to them. But the carrier is suppressed so that the final amp isn't overdriven and allows conversations on commercial band radios, those CB radios, this and band radios, the things that truckers and stuff use. Uh, one of the examples I like to give is at Fairchild, we had um, a station or a radio that was monitoring this using AME when hikers went out in the woods and they were to get lost or something were to happen to them. Uh, the SEER guys that I worked with, their other job was to go out and rescue these people. In addition to training Air Force and uh, our troops, that's what they did. They had another mission and they would go out and rescue these hikers by using some of these AME principles, these signals, just to find them because hopefully they had uh, radios programmed if their cell phones died with the signals that we had in our local base. It's pretty cool. Uh, CW is this mode that, 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 boop, that one kilohertz tone that y'all heard. I know I did a great job right there. Uh, what they did in Vietnam was they developed something called tapping out and although similar to Morse code, they would like tap on the wall. So like two taps would be a what? If I tapped once and then tapped it once again, what would that be? Oh my goodness, anybody. A, thank you. <laughs> A, yeah, very good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just like that. All right. Questions on that? No, right. same. Okay. Um, any questions on FM? We kind of went over this already. This is exactly what I went over with you guys already. I don't need to really touch on this slide again, I think. 
Uh, one thing to note, though, it is line of sight versus beyond line of sight, meaning it's not going to really use that ionosphere. You have to see what you're talking to. Yes? Right. Yes. All right. So let's see. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. We got these. This is all we have left. Okay. Ah! I think it messed up on me here. All right, so I'm just going to go over this stuff with you guys. I'll close this. These slides out. Because all we have left is really it's going to talk about equipment. Um, one of the things to note with equipment and when with your buying any kind of equipment or any radios or anything of that nature, you want to make sure that whatever you're buying comes with whatever's on the packing list, right? So the RT-1694 Delta, for example, that's the radio. If this entire bunch of stuff comes with the radio... Right, cool, you get a battery box, you get these ops manuals, tack chat software, you got your RPA, uh, you got your Nivis, your antennas, all that cool stuff, but you don't get the 1694 Delta, uh, what do you guys think is going to happen? You'll get demoted or something. You're going <laughs> to get demoted? You're going to have a problem. <laughs> Sorry, Gaston, thank you. Why, why are you immediately jumping into demotion like, with all of your answers? Sure how we got here. Yeah, I'm not too sure how we got there, but it definitely <laughs> escalated quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what happened there, but definitely escalated quickly. Yeah, no, you're not going to immediately jump to demotion. I know you guys want to kind of say that with stuff. Death? No, Chung. No one's going <laughs> to no one's gonna die if you forget to take accountability for a radio, all right? No. You might get yelled at, all right? But most likely what's going to happen is you're going to call the manufacturer and be like, hey, bro, we uh, ordered this piece of equipment, and uh, we'd really love it if you actually sent it to us. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, same. All right. Do we have any questions on anything I went over with you all today? Any questions for myself? Sarn Young, Sarn Gaston, Sarn McCormick peaced out. Yes, sir. We did have a question in the chat. Oh, sure. What do we got? I like how you put jail at the end of that. Okay. It was, does line of sight and beyond line of sight refer to the radio horizon? Yes. Uh, what do you mean the radio horizon? Like where the radio can see? Because the radio horizon refers to how far the radio can actually uh, shoot RF, basically. That's what the radio horizon is. Sergeant Young, maybe you can explain that a little bit better with some Block 7 terminology. Sergeant Young. Young went AFK a while back. Did he really? Yeah, he typed All it right. in the chat. Yeah, remember. so look, when I was talking to you guys earlier about line of sight versus like optical horizon, true horizon, radio horizon, you are going to learn a bunch of that stuff in Block 7. So I don't kind of want to like Get you. I don't want to get you all confused. You don't really need to know about that stuff right now for, for our purposes, for our test. But to answer your question, beyond line of sight, yeah, beyond line of sight refers to um, the ionosphere, right? We're using the ionosphere for beyond line of sight communications for the purposes of HF. Now, how far the radio horizon is, like how far the radio can see is, it's always going to be 15% further than our optical, right? So how far you can see. Does that make sense? Yes, same. Okay. That's all that's referring to. Or worse, getting expelled. Okay. All right. I'm going to I'm gonna cut the auto off here. Okay. 